Hi everyone, we're gonna get started. Um, I'm, I'm Emma. Uh, <laughs> so uh, our first author tonight is Joni Tevis, who is the author of The Wet Collection, a group of 40 lyric essays written with a poet's lyricism and a scientist's precision. Her other works have appeared in publications like Orion, Oxford American, and Shenandoah, among others. In 2006, she was awarded the Minnesota State Arts Board Grant. She currently teaches literature and creative writing at Furman University while working on a new book about ghost towns, tourist traps, and atomic dread. She is also, as I've learned over the course of the conference, a lovely person and a great conversationalist. Therefore, it is my pleasure to welcome Joni Tevis. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. And, and, and thank you to Matt for organizing all of this and, and for Jennifer, who is not here yet maybe, who will be here shortly, um, for inviting me. And also especially to Matt for taking me to look for trilobites today. Lots of fun, good times. Mm -hmm. And there are more out there to be found. Just waiting for you, okay. So I have, I have three essays to read tonight, and two are short and one is longer, and the, um, the first two are from my new book, which is going to come out next year from Milkweed, and is about the aforementioned ghost towns, tourist traps, and atomic dread. So keep an eye out for that. Milkweed next year, does it have a title yet? It does not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But we're going to go easy on the atomic dread tonight. So the first one is for my mother-in-law. Girl power, ode to the demolition derby. I'm going for Dr. Death, the little boy next to me said. We'd gone to the fair with my in-laws specifically to watch the demolition derby. The only reason to bother. The rat trap midway wasn't worth much. One year, my sister fell out of the tilt-a-whirl and had to get stitches. I could have skipped the livestock, just a couple of goats and makeshift pens, and a sad-looking elephant, kids pelted with treats. Worst of all was Bobo the Clown, a sleazy character working the dunk tank. Eyes ringed with dark, cigarette stub parked in the corner of his mouth, laugh ratcheting his gunfire. He had an angle, insulting women so men bought softballs to throw. Wolf whistle. If my mommy looked like that, I'd never have left home. Horse undertone. Give me a flashlight and a bottle of whiskey. I'll do it for my country. Mocking sing-song, mommy's little moron, mommy's little moron. The whole time I watched, nobody could dunk Bobo. They were too mad to aim. We found a spot in the stands and sat down. The man behind us said, all day long this fair made money. In front sat a skinny kid, bald already, and a girl I sensed was pregnant even before I saw her belly. That resigned look. They leaned close together. Part of the racetrack had been sectioned off with concrete barricades. Using the whole track would let the drivers build up too much speed. A man hosed down the pit to make it slippery and to reduce the fire hazard. The, uh, the announcer said, are you ready for some smashing, bashing, and crashing at the Upper South Carolina State Fair, this annual upstate tradition? We sure were. <laughs> the cars lined up, 20 or so, with names like Cat Dog, Just a Little Crazy, Punisher and Doom. I noticed an 84 Cadillac and a Ford LTD, but the others were too beat up to identify. The drivers faced off in heats of four or five while the others waited. The last car moving won each heat and became eligible for the finals. I learned later that most derbies have lots of rules. No windows, windshields, or headlights. No hearses, four by fours or filling your tires with cement. <laughs> no hitting on the driver's side. First time warning, second time removal. No cars over 4,800 pounds, i.e. no pre-1973 Lincoln Continentals. And obvious as it sounds, no cars under 2,600 pounds. Gremlins, Pintos, Datsun 280Zs. Passions run high over the 1960s era Chrysler Imperial. Some drivers swear by it, but many events specifically ban the Imperial because of its subframe, which has no weak spots or crash zones. One expert said that if an Imperial crashed into a contemporary SUV, the SUV would be inoperable while the Imperial could drive away. 
Not having a crash zone actually makes the car more dangerous than a collision. The driver's body bears most of the impact. Finally, after a guy in a tiger suit led the crowd in a weak rendition of Tiger Rag, the derby started. It looked like a free-for-all at first, and although some patterns emerged, luck mattered. Ricochets, chain reactions, misfires. Sometimes two cars faced off, only to be interrupted by a third, joining forces with one to batter the other. It was either complex or chaotic. I couldn't tell which. All I knew was that there was something very satisfying about seeing one of the cars get a running start and ram into another. <laughs> like pitching a softball and connecting with Bobo's bullseye. My mother-in-law and I clutched each other's knees and squealed. The woman beside us gave us a mean look and put her fingers in her ears. A fem I mean, seriously, if someone does that to you at a demolition derby, you know you're being loud. <laughs> a female driver from North Carolina, the first woman to compete, won her heat, $50 in a trophy, landing blows that crumpled fenders and crashed trunks. A good strategy, I read, is to back up into your opponent and smash his hood with your rear. She was expert at that. But during the finals, two other cars sandwiched her big gold caddy, girl power, until she couldn't move. Teamwork is against the rules, but impossible to enforce. When girl power had to forfeit, we were disappointed, but cheered for her when the announcer called her name. Then it was all over and everybody scrammed. Tow trucks lined up on the field to load the racks. I've never gone looking for a crash, but as I watched the woman in the gold Cadillac, I wanted to be her, driving hard with nothing to lose, rich as a dozen junkyards. What if you coasted down the mountain into a foothills town? Shift past the others and hit your enemy hard, dodge and veer as hot wind roars past your helmet. A scrim of other bust-ups as from the corner of your eye, you see him barreling toward you. He hits, and the impact shears your tire, rims skidding out showers of sparks. Burned rubber and blue exhaust, humid air, and afterward, everyone walks to the parking lot, saying words they can't hear, deafened by ruck, raw-throated. Here's the secret. To crash in a derby is to gull the bloodthirsty road gods. It's a bluff, a gin empty sacrifice, a tinsel death. So bust what's careful in yourself and see what comes. See if there's any play left in the wheel. <laughs> so from the Upper South Carolina State Fair and the Demolition Derby, we go to a jukebox. Second short essay, an ode, perhaps an elegy, perhaps an ode. Ode to a jukebox, starts it with an epigraph. Before you drop that quarter, play a song for me. Alan Jackson, that's right, Alan Jackson. When I fell for jukeboxes, they were already sliding toward oblivion. At a nice house in Houston, someone played an old Marty Robbins song, out in the West Texas town of El Paso. But what I remember is a guy in tight Levi's teaching women, other women, to two-step. I took a shot or two at the pool table and pretended I hadn't had to scrounge to buy my single shiner. Set it down too hard and the foam burbles out the neck. So embarrassing, but nobody notices, nor pays any mind when you get up to leave. Something like calling a radio station to dedicate a song, an act that feels very old fashioned now. Choosing a number on a jukebox gives you a brief share in the tune's ownership. You didn't write the music or record the words, but you selected it over the others, changing the evening from what it would have been into what it became by giving it a soundtrack. Exercising your authority over song and community takes only a quarter. But the plexiglass and pot metal consoles I knew were just pale descendants of machines that had been, once, both beautiful pieces of furniture and marvels of engineering. In the 1950s, Wurlitzer was a leading manufacturer of jukeboxes and a factory film from the era a visit to Wurlitzer, shows what the process was like. An unseen narrator intones, a quality product, did you say? Well, you can say that again, and still again, for that's the way Wurlitzer builds them, as the camera hovers outside the factory, lingering on beds of vegetables and zinnias, maybe a holdover from the victory gardens of the then recent past. 
pretty hard to imagine anything but a quality product coming out of a plant like this, the narrator says. And after a stop at research and development, brain sweat and blueprints, it's on to the woodworking department, annual consumer of 10 million feet of veneers and hardwoods. Even in black and white, the shapely cabinets gleam with wax. A slow pan shows the vast hangar of the work floor, man after man paired with his juke and rubbing hard with white flannel, putting his back into it, slow stepping in a tight circle. In the decades that followed, jukebox sales declined, squeezed out by television and other distractions. I was late to the party by about 50 years. <laughs> During the long solo road trips I used to make, I remember diners snug as ships afloat, their windows streaked with rain. Inside, it looked warm and dry. People bent over cups of coffee, appearing happier than they ever actually were. Walk inside and shake the rain from your jacket, glasses steaming from the griddle's heat. The waitress greets you without looking up, and you take a seat at the counter. Reserve booths for two or more, reads the sign. Once I eavesdropped on two men talking about work. The clean-shaven one was the local undertaker, and young for it, I thought. Just not for me, he said, eyes fixed on some point on the floor. The skinny cook dipped raw egg onto the griddle and dealt out slices of sausage that spat when they hit the heat. Try and stick it out a while longer, his friend said. Later you can take stock. The cook grabbed weights and pressed them on the sausage to keep down the fat. Someone had picked the bouncy Mambo Number no. 5 on the jukebox, <laughs> its brassy riffs and catalog of conquest pouring out of tinny speakers. You can't run. You can't hide. Outside, cold rain poured down, and the sound of a big rig's Jake brakes came squealing up from the off-ramp. You and me gonna touch the sky. That night it was Georgia, but I remember scenes just like it from Jacksonville to Tucson. Tired faces and sighs. The awkward combination of babies and cigarette smoke. And the jukebox against the wall had a presence like a sleeping animal promising to help the night along if only you'd let it, pressing those satisfying square buttons, the albums in their sleeves slapping against each other as you flip from beginning to end, telling these strangers and yourself, here's who I am. The night outside, so dark, but you go back into it, filling up with gas at the station next door and pushing on toward the next big town. A stretch of interstate in southern Mississippi so empty I had the high beams on for miles, Asphalt stretching away into shadowy stands of pines. Part of I-10, just outside Pensacola, where the road dove down into the bay and the tunnel's cold lights made the roof tiles gleam. Somewhere outside Nacogdoches. So tired, I thought I saw a faded barn uproot itself and slide across the road in front of me. Now there are times I crave those drives like some women crave earth with a dark and secret want. Of all the faces I saw, there were none I wanted to know. But for his, existing for me then only as a dim hope. I miss not solitude but this. I'd been a good girl and am now a safe woman, but there was a time between when no one knew my name. Cutting it close with not a dime to spare. Looking back, I claim every mile I drove alone, keeping afloat with the frail stays of ignition spark, old song lines, reflections in finger-marked chrome, gritted my teeth and accelerated onto the freeway. Time passes and we select the cells we become. Now I go with him to the diner down the road. It's rainy and cold, but we don't have far to drive. Six plays for a dollar and lots of Johnny Cash to choose from. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? June Carter singing the eerie counterpoint. Folsom Prison Blues, live version. Inmates cheering when Johnny sings that line about shooting a man in Reno. Shared things, communal as a train whistle. A woman at a booth behind us closes her eyes and sings along. Drunk? We can't tell. Then a kid with choppy hair slumps over and picks Stevie Ray Vaughan. We nod. Respectable choice. <laughs> what now of the Wurlitzer plant? The men work there for years and always together tending machines in the metal shop, poring over plans that unspooled for miles. Complicated pin mechanism, coin drops, selectors. Five years after the war ended, and what had they seen before? Better not to say. 
Better to punch in, take your smoke break, lunch outside with your pals when the weather was fine. Spend your day assembling parts that made it exactly with their partners, or clamping layers of veneer and pushing them through the quick baking kiln. As somewhere in the Adirondacks, an oak grows a little taller and someone hones a blade. Wurlitzer knows it's woodworking all the way from the forest primeval to the finished phonograph, says the narrator. The North Tonawanda plant stopped making jukeboxes in 1974. Gone the arguments of nickel versus dime play. Gone the bill proposing Congress split the difference by minting seven and a half cent coins. <laughs> One of the most popular selections was the blank record, a long-lasting 45. Your coin bought you three minutes of quiet, <laughs> but not silence. That hiss so like the sound of tires on a road, a pop as you drift over into the rumble strip, muted but not empty, full of what could be, precious and fading, over before you know it, without you even listening. So, all right, and this one, this one is from the first book, and this is my one straight up memoir, so I wanted to read it, and so it goes about, about 12 minutes, so we should be perfect. All right, my one really memoir. It's in sections. I stood in a clearing, but beyond the wilderness, that's the title, beyond the wilderness. I stood in a clearing, she said, much later. Light all around, but darkness above me. Looked up and saw something falling from the sky, fast, something heavy, something dark, too fast for me to stop. She knew it would strike. I put my arm up to cover my head, a reflex. It would do no good. Oh God, I said, and then it hit. One, as gunmetal clouds piled in the west, he ate his simple meal sandwich, apple, and sheltered in the mouse-smelling dark of the hunter's shack. Rain came hard, battering the standing corn, streaking the leaves with soupy dirt. Lightning forked over the woods, and he saw it out of the corner of his eye as he stared at that storied ground, thinking about something or other. Near the north boundary line was a spot where people said an Indian princess had been buried, and in the back field, a symmetrical hill sloped up to a shelf, then down again. People said it was a mound made for some kind of harvest ritual. He didn't know one way or the other, but plowed it every spring and watered the, the shoots that grew there. Two. In Logan County, Central Ohio, the seasons are distinct, enthusiastic. Spring, black turned to earth, can break your heart with hope. Summer, golden corn in the silo, is hotter than you think possible. Winter, dark trees, curling smoke, lasts forever. But this is an autumn story, and just as the other seasons have their colors, so does autumn. Brown, for potatoes, for shadows in the empty barn, for frost-killed stalks lying broken on cold ground, for months that leave nothing behind but the land's very shape. Hills curve like a well-loved body, pond water like chrome, then sunset, and light drains from everything. My father's father was a hired man on a farm in Logan County. One of 11 children, he'd been raised poor, wrapping himself in newspapers to get through the bitter winters. He worked hard his whole life, just to get by, doing whatever job he could find. Many a farmhouse around there had a roof he'd nailed or siding he'd painted, and he'd swept the schoolhouse floors, driven the bus. But Prowl's farm was the work of his life. Ever since he turned 14, he'd been plowing and seeding Prawl's fields, cutting and stacking and pitching his hay, spreading his cow's manure. My grandfather tended another man's land until the day he died, and later, when they thought of it, his sons would say, that's just the way things were then. His wife, my father's mother, worked for decades in the hospital's laundry, a job that suited her firecracker energy. She never missed a shift. Years of scrubbing her neighbor's stubborn blood from sheets taught her every trick for getting rid of the stains a hurting body makes. This was just the work she did for pay. At home, she worked harder still. The little four-room house, built long before by runaway slaves, had a floor that canted on its foundation and a bucket of well water that froze hard on winter nights. 
She stuffed newsprint into the gaps in the wall and papered over so it wouldn't show. Raised four boys on potatoes and little else. Took baths in the cellar once a week. Used a three-seat outhouse out back. She scoured the kitchen floor on her hands and knees, even at the end. Said it cleaned better than a mop. When winter broke and sap rose in the maple trees, he collected metal spouts in the cans where he kept them, bored holes in the trunks, and hung buckets from nails. He poured full buckets into the sugar shed's great keeping tank and fed the fire all through the night, resting sometimes, smelling dust and old birds' nests, the sweet fog of bubbling sugar. When the sap shrank after long boiling, he pulled it off into cans with prawl syrup painted on the side. If this touched his pride, it was one of many things he never mentioned. Once the snow melted, he kept an eye out for mushrooms. The calendar was no help. It had to do with a feeling in the air, a certain cool dampness, with a warm breeze promising that the lilacs and peonies of Memorial Day and beyond would bud and bloom again this year. He could taste when it was time, and as he went about his work, he looked for the pointed tops of morels pushing through the leaf litter, he stepped off the trail and through the maypops, lifting the leaves with the side of his hand. In a good year, he filled bag after bag with mushrooms plucked from rotten logs from the shadow of spreading walnut or hickory. He soaked them in salt water overnight and fried them next day in flour and fat. They tasted of nuts and molasses, yeasty, like earth, like dough. She dreamed sometimes of things to come. Knew the pregnancies of other women before they knew themselves. Thickening bud of red tulip flesh, she knew. Of the teenage granddaughter and to the anxious daughter-in-law. To her, she said, six months from now, a girl, don't worry. I had a dream about it. Mine was that predicted birth. She dreamed of change but kept it to herself, biding her time. So past 50 seed times in harvest, most marked by some event, the year he laid irrigation pipe in the back field. The year she bore their last son. The year of the great potato harvest. Their four sons grew to men, married, had children of their own. The span of a life cannot be summed up in a few lines. But this is all I have. Nothing written in their hands. This and what I've seen myself. Arms and napes creased from years of sun. Hands knuckled and knobbed from long working. Fall came hard in 1980, real snow by election day, dead berry canes rattling in a cold wind. In the slow time that followed, he caught up on chores he'd let slide during the busy harvest season. He tied new insulation around the cellar pipes, honed and oiled summer tools and wrapped them in rags, noticed the wood pile wasn't as substantial as it ought to have been. So he took his chainsaw into the woods to clear some brush. It was a gray Wednesday in late November, Thanksgiving Eve, and he planned to get home early. It was a path he'd walked countless times. He scanned the trees on either side of the tractor trail, looking for dead wood, and when he saw a snag, he turned aside, pulled the cord, and heard the chainsaw rip to life. Safely upslope, clear of the fall line, he touched the saw to the trunk and sawdust streamed down. The work he did required a great deal of selective awareness. He was practically deaf, for instance, to the chainsaw, but alert to the crack of a falling branch. The vibrating saw masked the tree's smaller movements, but within the thrumming undercurrent, he felt the tree shift as it gave. He knew there were risks, had had his share of close calls, but trusted himself implicitly. He had to. Then he heard the rotten crunch of a limb, looked up, and breathed, Oh God, just as she had dreamed he would. Part three. Moses led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. He hid his face where he was afraid to look at God. That's from Exodus 3. Ravens croaked, flapping toward a stream bright as mica. The far slopes changed color as a cloud passed over. Flat white flowers bloomed beside him as he trudged along, lost in thought. The dusty hem of his robe swept the trailside flowers, shaking them on their stems, and he could have been blind for all he noticed. He was thinking about something, who knew what, as his feet carried him along the familiar route. Maybe he calculated the extra forage his ewes would need for lambing. Maybe he wondered whether his wife would finish the evening meal. 
Then, without realizing why, he looked up, and it was like waking from a dream. When he turned his head to the right, he felt as if he'd stepped into a furnace, blasted, his eyes watering, face flaming. He saw the bush a few steps away. The air above it rippled, a braided river of flame. When a twig cracked in the heat, he jumped. That sound must have been what woke him before. But something wasn't right. That blaze was burning hotter than most fires did, he knew, and yet the flames didn't consume the bush. Its small leaves, instead of curling into ash and dropping to the ground, remained distinct, as did the limbs supporting them. He stepped off the path to investigate. An old man, he was a herder of flocks and nothing more. That is, until he left the trail, intent on discovering the secret. He lifted a foot and placed it carefully on the desert sand, by that motion transformed from shepherd to patriarch. And approaching the fire, he realized this was more than an oddity. It was a sign that, perhaps because he noticed, was meant for him. Without taking his eyes from the blaze, he reached down and unlaced first one dusty sandal and then the other, dropping them in the sand, hardly conscious of what he was doing. Standing on ground he knew was holy, he waited for the word to come. Part four. She made a casserole for the next day and cut up potatoes to fry. Outside, the afternoon faded, and she started to worry. Not for the first time. She knew the dangers of working on a farm. She called her third son, my father, and asked him to go to Prawls and check. In the gray November twilight, he parked on the side of the road and headed into the woods. Wind blew the fallen leaves in rattling clouds. His shoes crunched on the leaves and gravel. That and the sighing wind were the only sounds. No whining saw or chugging tractor, and he didn't like it. He switched on his flashlight, sweeping its beam across the woods from right to left, over trees he'd known since he was a child. He found his father lying on the ground, one arm tucked under his body, the other, broken, flung over his head. Blood on his arm, his face, blood in dulling puddles on leaves, blood pulled away into dark soil. The blade of the chainsaw lay sunk in the groove it had dug for itself. When he picked it up later, it wouldn't start. It ran itself out of gas. When the coroner arrived, he said the falling branch had killed him instantly. He hadn't felt anything after the initial blow, but he had seen it coming. They knew by the way he had thrown the saw from him. I wasn't with him that cold afternoon, and yet, in years since, I've watched it happen again and again. His vision struck him dumb and struck him down. There was no living witness. But a week before the accident, his wife dreamed herself in a clearing, looked up, and saw something falling fast. Oh, God, she, he, says, throwing an arm up to blunt the impact. After that, everything changed. A few months after my grandfather's death, my father took a job in South Carolina, over 500 miles away. I was a child, five years old, and my sister had just been born. My father had always lived in Ohio, and so had my mother, and her mother, and her mother's mother. We moved south where my sister and I grew up. Because the Bible was the book we knew best, when I think of my family's particular history, I read it in biblical terms. Like this. He had a vision of a horror. He sent us on our way to a place he himself would never reach. That moment of revelation, when he realized his life was about to end, he threw the saw from him. That's the moment I can't let go of. That's the moment I keep trying to read. What about his wife, his widow? People said it was a freak accident. People said he didn't suffer. It was the best way for him to go. Did she wonder if she could have prevented it? If she'd said, maybe you could tinker around the barn today, take it easy, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Or, feels like a storm's coming. Wind dislodges the limb and it falls harmlessly in a hail of twigs, smashes on the leaf-drifted ground, breaks into fragments in the deserted winter woods. Could she have convinced him? He wouldn't have listened. Bullheaded. Got to do it, he would have said. You worry too much cursed with the power to see her grief tearing toward her and helpless to turn it aside. He didn't leave much. A black and white photo, 
taken the year of the record potato harvest. He stands in the cellar of Prawl's farmhouse, a potato cup in each hand, a mountain of tubers behind him, stacked floor to rafters. In this moment, wearing his laborer's clothes and looking proud, he seems to know that sometimes hard work is rewarded, though he couldn't have known what was coming. A good death, if too soon, doing useful work in a place he loved. A life of work, siphoning sugar from trees, shucking husk and silk from corn, leavening soil with manure. I wonder what he thought about, working alone in the field day after day, making those wordless, repeated motions. He was a silent man. The wood he cut warmed another man's farmhouse through a long winter. For a man who lived his life so tied to the seasons, it seems right that his death came for him at autumn's turning to winter. With his body, he left a pair of broken glasses, a wristwatch, and a bone-handled pocket knife. Vision, time, utility. To his sons, he left blunt red hands and stout fingers. He left those who would remember him, carry his name, and I'm one. Six. The ponds ringed now with alder and cattails. Red-winged blackbirds perch, crying trunkily. And in wet years, the slate lined creek is full of speckled creek chubs and shiners. Worn trails crisscross the woods, and grass grows in the gravel he dumped in the low places to keep the tractor from wallowing. Thickets of brush between the oaks, sugar maples, buckeye, walnut trees. Nobody's cleared the undergrowth in years. On the neighboring farms, enormous machines with air conditioned cabs move slowly across the fields where, as a boy, my father hunted flint flakes and arrowheads. The last time my father and I visited Logan County, we walked Prawl's farm without saying much. In the old hunter's shack, we sat in the dust and laddered light. While he sat thinking, I went out to the cornfield, dug a little dirt, and put it in a plastic bag. I didn't know then why I did it. Now I think the old pull toward the place was something passed on to me unearned. Like dark eyes and a tendency to hoard. Fondness for horseradish and a predilection toward eating watermelon with a knife. There must be countless ticks I carry that I think mistakenly originated with me. Odd, particular, this family inheritance. Prawl's farm hasn't been worked in years and his grandchildren grow old. Just a matter of time, I know, until they sell out piecemeal in squares and rectangles. Little houses on cul-de-sacs for the people who work at the Honda plant down the road. But not this. This is mine, this thing I've stolen. Scant handful of earth and root threads taken close to the spot where my father's father died. The dark earth took his blood, held him close at the end. And now I'll say that land was his. Never mind whose name was inked on the deed. He signed his contract with nail heads hammered flush in irrigation trenches laborious characters. In spout holes he healed now where maple sap dripped. If I could go back to those woods, I would touch my fingers to the round scars in the bark. Thank you.